go ahead and get started. Um, I'm glad to see we have such a good turnout here. We've got a full house, so thank you everyone for coming. Um, again, my name is Sarah Vanek, and I am an extension associate at the University of Kentucky. I work primarily with the nursery industry in central Kentucky and a little bit with the landscape industry as well. Um, so as you know, the theme for today is increasing efficiency and pest management. And I will be starting the day talking about increasing efficiency in general um, with some examples that relate to pest management. Um, so I've been thinking about this topic um, quite a bit recently. Um, and a lot of the ideas that I've gotten have come from this idea called uh, lean management. So a lot of the concepts I'll present here come from lean management, but this is not an introduction to lean management. Um, so I just want to kind of get the ball rolling and thinking about efficiency in a new way. Um, so this t uh, presentation could be called Lean Team Habits for Working Smarter, Not Harder. And again, I'll try to include some examples that do relate to pest management. So I'll start with what is lean? Uh, lean is a systematic approach for eliminating waste and increasing efficiency. It is a discipline that was created by Toyota. Um, and it's often described as a way of thinking and acting and a gen generally a culture of learning. It's about um, continuous improvement. And it should be remembered that lean is not a one-time fix-it approach. So the underlying principle of lean lies in this um, concept of thinking about um, value and waste. So the idea is that every action or resource can be um, considered either value or waste. So value is what your customer is willing to pay for. Um, it might be a pest-free tree, a nicely shaped tree. Um, it might be your very timely deliveries or your excellent customer service. It's the things that draw your customer to your business, to your product, to your service. Waste, on the other hand, are all the additional costs that you, the company, has to pay for because your customer really has no interest in them. Um, your customer doesn't think about these things and it's not what draws the customer to your product or service. So these might include the paperwork that you have to do, anytime you have to repair your equipment, um, moving your employees or moving materials from one location to another, um, or equipment changeover. Unfortunately though, waste is necessary. Some forms of waste are necessary. But the goal is to um, minimize waste as much as we can and to really focus on those value adding activities. Um, and this can sometimes require quite a bit of creativity and really an openness to change. Um, just to give you an idea on this, I'm not sure where the rest of my pie went, but um, it is estimated that about 95% of activity in most businesses is non-value adding. Um, so let's think about an example of value adding. Um, maybe it's snow removal. That's what the customer is paying you for. So non-value adding would be everything else. Um, the explaining to your employees how to get to the site, the time you spent in paperwork, the time you spend putting the plow onto the truck. The customer doesn't think about those things, that's not why they're paying you. But we shouldn't be discouraged because even Toyota, who is the master of lean, and um, uh, they are even only at 50%. Okay, so there are some objectives that I'd like to start with that kind of lay the foundation for thinking about um, Im uh, improvement. Um, first of all, it's important to always make it a team effort. And we should be asking the question, how can we together make this better? Some of the benefits of making it a team effort, um, the workers who are 
themselves doing, um, conducting the tasks that are in consideration, they are the ones that have the first-hand knowledge of those operations, and they are often the ones who contribute the most valuable input. Also, if employees feel that they're involved in the process, um, they can see it as a cooperative effort um, rather than something that's imposed on them. Um, and they, they feel that they have the power to improve their working conditions um, and to feel that they, are, um, they have the power to become more productive. Also, having a, a diverse team, say maybe including a mechanic on your team, um, your accountant, um, an arborist, you know, all the different aspects of your business. If you bring everybody together, they have diverse backgrounds and they can ask the sincere question, hey, why do you do it that way? And that can lead to some really valuable discussion and you start thinking outside of the box of, hey, why do we do it this way? Um, points to consider with that, though, is humility and respect. It can sometimes be difficult to hear someone say that your way is not necessarily the best way. Maybe you've been doing it this way for years. Um, so it takes a little bit of humility to um, accept that criticism. And improvement efforts must always be done with respect for people. Um, we must remember that the problems are in the system and most likely not in the people. I think generally speaking, when employees come to work, they want to do a good job. They want to be productive. Most people don't go to work thinking, okay, how can I screw this up today? Um, of course, some workers are harder workers than others. Some are more reliable than others. But generally speaking, most people do want to do their job well. Um, and so it is up to the leadership to try to change the system so that it becomes easy for employees to do their job well. So we need to focus on the system itself and not necessarily the people. Of course, with respect for the people. Um, the second objective is to define the best way. Um, you can ask yourself, does our team, do we have a correct way of conducting this task? Or is everybody just kind of doing it their own way? Um, and we know that if we have a clear system with clear objectives, we're much more likely to have consistent outcomes and the desirable outcomes. And then with a clear system, our problems also become much more obvious and they're easier to address. Um, and, uh, and to resolve those problems. So this idea of um, coming up with a clear system with a best way is um, oftentimes called standardization. So I'm just going to run through some examples of how standardization might be applied in the real world. Um, again, asking have we established a correct way or a defined way of doing this? Um, so these are just several examples. I won't spend too much time on them. Um, but what about scouting for pests? Do we have a protocol put in place? Um, here's a scouting um, clipboard. On the back of the clipboard is a diagram of how to scout in the greenhouse. It shows um, how many plants do we look at on each bench, how do we efficiently move throughout the, the greenhouse, where are the yellow sticky traps, um, what kind of things do we look for, different examples, when do we scout each of the greenhouses, um, so do we have a clear system in place. What about, um, what are we actually recording when we scout, do we have a form that we fill out. And how do we explain what plants need attention? Um, this photo comes from Greenleaf Plants in La Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, they, this is a greenhouse operation. And what happened here was they had a vacancy. Um, the, pos the person who was in charge of spraying the greenhouses um, left that position and so the general manager kind of had to temporarily fill that position and he said that he was just getting bombarded with paperwork, all these 
scouting forms that had been filled out um, for all of the different greenhouses and he just did not have the time to sort through all of those and to decide what needs to be sprayed and what's fine. Um, so he, they came up with this system very quickly. They used a whiteboard um, with um, each of these columns represents a bench in a greenhouse. And then each row represents a week. So there are three weeks represented here. And then they used these magnets to show kind of what's going on at each bench. Um, so basically it shows are the pests below the threshold, everything's basically fine, or um, are they above the threshold, um, does some action need to be taken. So this allowed the manager to quickly see what's going on in the greenhouse and what action needs to be taken. It also, um, by representing multiple weeks, shows how things are changing. Are things improving or not? Um, what about follow-up inspections? How do we quickly find those plants that need follow-up inspections? Do we have a system in place? And maybe the color orange on this flagging tape represents um, that the, that plant needs to be inspected for a certain pest, or maybe that color means something specifically. Uh, what do we do if we see a certain pest? Um, this photo was taken at Hoffman Nursery and um, they had these disease identification sheets in a visible location for their employees and on each sheet they have an action to take. Um, for this one, if this plant is found infected, throw the plant away, do not compost it. Um, so is there a clear action set in place that all of the employees are, are aware of? How do we know when we need to reorder our chemicals? Um, this was taken at Greenleaf Plants in Lan Lancaster, Pennsylvania again. Um, what they did was on their storage shelves, they have a designated location for every product. And the second product in line has a tag on it with information about the product. If an employee empties the first bag in line and has to open the second bag, then they have to remove that tag they place it in a, a reorder box. And so the person who, can, who has to reorder the products, they don't have to do all kinds of inventory to see how much do we have, how much do we need. They already know they can just go to that box, pull out whatever tags are in there, and those are the products that need to be reordered. <laughs> Okay, what about our equipment maintenance? Um, this is a really um, important um, point for increasing efficiency. Um, I'm, a, I'm sure you all know that having your equipment break down right at the point when you need it most is not the ideal situation. Um, that can lead to really unhappy customers if it slows down your work. Um, so do we have a system in place for maintaining our equipment to prevent these kind of problems? This is at Gold Hill Nursery um, in Oregon, and they have a, a whiteboard system where they keep track of all their equipment. So they have the, the name of the equipment uh, or the unit, the date that each annual inspection takes place, um, the date of the last just basic service that was done, and the date that the next service is due. Um, this is not really related to pest management, but what about dealing with um, new sales or new customers? Is there a protocol in place of how do we work with our customers? This example was from a landscape design firm and they have a list of, of all the, the things that they do for a new sale, um, what kind of interactions they have with their customers. Um, examples, um, Walk the prop. Oops. Walk the property and take notes. Discuss ideas or improvement options. Review the client's wish lists and goals. Uh, discuss budgets and fill out the sample budget sheet with the client. Uh, those kind of things. 
Um, okay, so that was the second objective. Do we have a clear system in place? So now let's say we've got a system. Um, the third objective is how do we make this easier for employees to do the right thing? Um, how do we make it more intuitive for employees? And uh, so the goal is to imagine that anyone could step into that system and understand basically what's going on and what needs to be done. Um, as you can imagine, this is very helpful for when you hire new employees. Um, also, the benefits are that there's less time spent giving instructions, there are fewer misunderstandings and mistakes. Um, you can, the employees can conduct their work faster and easier. Um, and also, if you have a key employee that's absent um, for vacation or illness or whatever reason, it's easier for other people to fill in for them um, if, they can, if there's a clear, intuitive system in place that everyone's kind of on the same page with. Um, so one way to make systems more intuitive is to use visual cues. Uh, visual can be, cues can, they convey information very quickly and they're highly intuitive. Um, so a common example is our traffic signs. Um, can you imagine what it would be like if we were driving around and all of our traffic signs were in text? Obviously that's not an efficient system. Um, this is much more intuitive. It conveys the, the message very quickly. These are other examples, um, symbols, colors for uh, maps, um, maybe hand signals. Most people know this means peace. Um, things like that. Um, so now we'll give some real world examples of visual cues that might be used in the workplace. Um, so how do we keep our space neat and tidy so that things are easy to find, we're not wasting time looking all over for something? Um, and how do we make sure that things aren't missing or know if something is missing? Um, one example is to use these shadow boards. Um, this is a, a, a green leaf plants again where they mix different products um, and they have these shadow boards where everything is outlined in a different color so you know exactly where something belongs, you know if something's missing, you know where to find different things. Um, this photo on the right um, was taken at Valley Hill Nurseries here in Kentucky um, owned by Todd Ryan. A similar idea is foam boards and drawers. Um, these can be custom designed for your own needs. Um, again, how do we keep things safe and tidy? Um, we can use floor markings to clearly show uh, what areas need to be kept clear um, or show where different items belong. And I think initially when you look at this, this looks a little silly. Do we really need to mark the floor with where the waste basket goes? But I think it does have some really practical implications for keeping things in their place and keeping aisles clear so that they're safe. And um, you know, in some cases, maybe pallets, it would be really practical to know exactly where those need to be placed for moving equipment around the space. Um, how do we perform tasks faster? Um, what about using color coding? This example comes from Wallach Nursery in Louisville. Um, what they have here is um, pink and yellow markings on their plant racks. And these, um, the shelves on these, the racks can be adjusted to different heights. And they do that according to the height of the plants that are placed on the racks. Um, so they can, the employees know based on the size of the plant if those racks, um, they either get placed at the pink settings or the yellow settings. And they quickly know exactly where those go. Um, what about color coding our tools? Let's say we have a piece of equipment that it, we are constantly working on. Um, maybe um, adding pieces or um, that type of thing. So you can, um, oops, you could color coordinate your wrenches and maybe put a dab of paint on um, the bolt that 
matches the color of the wrench. So you can quickly find exactly which wrench is needed for that piece of equipment. Also, maybe it's your clipboards. If they have different categories of um, information, maybe use color coding to keep those straight. Okay, back to this example. Um, talking about making systems intuitive, they have a system in place, but I myself am not really sure what these mean. Lucky number 13, FL70, maybe all of you are familiar with these, but um, new employees might not be. Um, so is there a better system for keeping our equipment straight so everybody knows what we're talking about? Um, and this made me think of the University of Kentucky. We have many, many vehicles that the university has to keep track of. And every vehicle in the window has a number to identify that vehicle. And on our keys, Oh, I don't have it anymore, but our keys have the number of our vehicle on it. So there's a very clear system, an intuitive system put in place. Okay, objective number four, um, plan to make it habit. Um, there are so many times when we all make improvements, but days or weeks or months later, everything just kind of falls apart and we end up back to where we started. <laughs> so it's important that if you make these improvements, you have to have a plan of how are we going to sustain this. And this does take some effort, um, but there is reward in it. Um, so the goal, again, is to strive for continual improvement. So we make improvements and we'll continue to improve upon those. Um, so reevaluation and reinforcement are absolutely essential. Um, maybe you need to establish weekly, monthly, or quarterly evaluations. And you as a team, you ask these questions, are we reaching our goals? Are we following the system that we put in place? And if we're not following it, why aren't we following it? Maybe, um, maybe there's still a better way. Maybe we're not following it because it's not the most efficient way. Or maybe we're not following it because it's not that intuitive and it's difficult for employees to know what it is they're supposed to be doing. Um, so to go back and look at the changes and think, okay, how can we make this better again? Um, maybe it's just establishing some um, kind of chore lists where you assign certain um, tasks to employees to keep things in their place. Here they have this nice shadow board going on, but it's not being used correctly. So maybe at the end of each day or every Friday, we go through and we make sure that things got put back where they belong. Um, here I included this photo. Here's where the fire extinguisher goes, but where's the fire extinguisher? And how's anybody going to get to it with all this stuff in the way? And it, it's even roped off. This is our emergency equipment and we can't even get to it. Okay, so that was laying the foundation. We need to make it a team effort, get everybody involved. Um, define a clear system, um, make the system intuitive so it's easy to follow, and prepare to make it ha habit so that it can be sustained. So now moving forward with some other ideas of things to think about, other objectives. Uh, maybe it's our communication. How is our team communication? Um, poor communication methods can lead to misunderstandings, mistakes, rework, um, time lost waiting for instructions, um, and ultimately dissatisfied customers. So here I'm going to provide an example that comes from Greenleaf Plants again in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, as you've probably gathered by now, they are really on top of it with implementing lean and increasing efficiency in their operations. So I've got a lot of examples from them. Um, but they produce a wide range of bedding plants and some other types of plants as well. Their old approach was that they used a computer-based computer scheduling program to coordinate all of their activities. And they had work orders that were printed up f based on the computer's schedule. And this in, um, 
was used for a variety of activities such as roguing the plants, moving the plants from the propagation house to the production house, applying preventive um, applications, um, sanitizing the beds that were empty, and then maintaining any plants that were not um, sold on schedule. So some of the problems with the old process was that the computer schedule didn't accurately reflect the actual growth of the plants. So then the propagator would have to go back in and manually adjust the computer schedule. Um, but all the printed schedules and work orders that are hard copies don't have those updates. And so um, the employees had all of this paperwork that wasn't even correct and everybody was confused about what is going on and what they need to be doing. So their solution, the first part of the solution was to use these um, flags to communicate work orders. Um, here you see all these plots have these flags in them. So what happened was the propagator now looks at the plants, decides when they're ready to be moved, and the propagator places a green flag in the plants that are finished with the propagation process. And that green flag means that these, fl these flats need to be rogued. So the roguing crew comes in, they see the flags, and they rogue the, those plants. Um, then when they're finished, they place a red flag. The red flag means these flats are ready to be moved to the production house. So the moving crew comes in, they see those flags, they move them, and then they place the yellow checkered flag. And that means that these plants have just been moved and they are ready to be given the preventive um, pesticide application. So um, that was the first part of the solution. The second part is to use this whiteboard chart. And again, each of these columns represents a bench on the greenhouse. And over on the right, we have all these different activities. Um, and these magnets are placed to indicate a work order. So here we have a magnet that shows at bench 110 there are some plants that are ready to be moved. So then the moving crew sees this board. They say, OK, we need to go to bench 110. They look for the flags that are on bench 110, and they know which plants need to be moved. So the benefits of the new system is that all that confusing paperwork is completely eliminated. Employees don't have to wait for their supervisors to give them instructions. They come in and they know exactly what needs to be done and they can go ahead and get to work. Um, the new employees that are hired, they learn the system very quickly. All of the scheduling is in real time and it reflects the actual needs based on plant growth. And also the visual communication bypasses any language barriers that might exist. I know that that is sometimes a challenge in our industry when we have a lot of Spanish speaking workers as well. So the visual communication bypasses a lot of those issues. Also, they found that implementation of this visual system removed about 25 to 30 hours weekly of unnecessary work and it increased their production cap capacity by about 20%. Okay, so maybe another thing to be thinking about, which I know everybody already thinks about, is minimizing unnecessary movement. And that might be just movements across a room that continually happen, across a nursery, or maybe across the town. Um, one way to minimize excess movement is point of use storage. Um, this example again comes from Valley Hill Nurseries um, from Todd Ryan here in Kentucky. They have this cart that they've set up where everything that they might possibly need for welding is on that cart and ready to go, whether it's gloves or rods or whatever it might be. It's all on the cart. Nobody has to search around the shop finding all the different things that they need. They don't get started on the job and then think, oh, I forgot this. So everything is right there, ready to go. 
Another example of point of use storage, maybe it's your tool boxes in your trucks. Um, maybe they are organized for specific tasks um, that you are regularly conducting. So everything's in one spot um, ready to go. What about cleaning up plant debris? Maybe if you're um, working with plants quite a bit and there's a lot of debris, um, is there some way to um, direct the uh, cleanup of that debris? Um, here at Greenleaf Plants, they conducted these workstations, or put together these workstations uh, where all the debris just falls directly into these containers below. So nobody has to sweep up too much afterward. What do you do with the soil afterwards, compost it? I think that would depend on what your own um, your own goals and how you want to deal with it. I was kind of wondering about that and I forgot to ask them why they were putting them in plastic bags and containers. I would think they would be composting them, but I didn't ask about that. Um, and can we somehow figure a way to kill two birds with one stone. Um, some, some of you have maybe seen this example before, again from Todd Ryan at Valley Hill Nurseries, but they have set up their tractor um, with multiple hitches so that they can actually cultivate the soil um, as they're mowing, or they can spray fertilizer as they're mowing. So they make one pass down the field and they've accomplished two tasks. So that saves them a, a tremendous amount of time. Also, again, just keeping things straight and easy to find. Um, at Valley Hill Nurseries, they've put together these bins where each bin is for a designated piece of equipment. Any extra pieces that belong to that piece of equipment go in the bin. Okay, so these were just kind of some ideas, um, hopefully sparked some ideas that um, might apply to your own operations. Um, but. Maybe we need some more ideas of how and where to start. Um, but I would mostly encourage you to try storm. When you're brainstorming ideas, um, really try to make it hands-on and just go ahead and try something and see how it works. Um, an example of this is from a lean workshop that I organized at Valley Hill Nurseries. Um, here is Todd Ryan right here. Um, and this was a hands-on uh, workshop where we looked at their digging process for digging trees out of their field. And we were trying to think of ways to make the, fish, the system a little more efficient. And um, what the, one of the groups came up with, um, they're looking at this process of changing the spades on the digging equipment. Um, these spades have to be changed based on the size of the root ball. And, um, and there are these large pins put in place um, when they change those spades. So what was happening before was these pins, as they were taken out and put back in, they would get set on the tailgate of the pickup truck that was, that was nearby, and they were kind of going back and forth like that. So the group thought, why don't we just weld a giant magnet onto the equipment itself so those hold the pins right in place. So the employees, all they have to do is grab the pin and put it in place. They're not walking back and forth to find the pins. Another example of tri storming. Um, this was a lean workshop that I conducted at Wallach Nursery in Louisville. And Elizabeth Peters, who helped lead, she's from Oregon, she helped lead this workshop. Um, we were looking at the potting process and there was a lot of media that was getting spilled. Um, and so she thought, well, what if we had a brush connected to the equipment that could brush the media back into the container? So she asked them, hey, do you have a brush? They said, yeah, I think we've got one around here somewhere. She grabbed the brush and she gave it a try. So this is try storming. Just go ahead and try it. Um, use whatever you have around to try it and permanent changes can be made later if, if you think it's uh, worth making it permanent. Um, so I would say that you know this can be a little overwhelming when you think about your operation as a whole, but if you focus on specific areas with the greatest need, that's a good place to start and just make a few goals at a time and really focus on those um, and, and make sure that you have some success there and 
that you work on sustaining those successes um, and then you can start moving to other areas as well. Um, I would also encourage you that if you are really interested in lean as a whole um, to connect with other people who are already implementing lean. And if you're interested in learning more, please let me know. I'd be happy to talk with you about it more. Um, Dr. Ingram and I are working on a publication about lean um, principles in the nursery industry. And that's one of the handouts that we have here. That's an abbreviated version of it. But I encourage you to take a look at that as well. Um, I'd like to acknowledge all the nurseries and individuals who have given me a lot of input on this topic. Um, Todd Ryan and Jim Wallach here in Kentucky have been very helpful. Um, and I think it's important to remember that best is the enemy of better. Um, I know that that is a problem that I face a lot of times trying to be a perfectionist. I have um, sometimes difficulty moving forward because I expect things to be perfect. So make sure that you just um, go ahead and try something and don't expect it to be perfect the first time. This video has been part of the University of Kentucky Nursery Crops web series. For more information on the topics discussed, please contact your county extension office.